Ecology. I'm here today, not just as Kieran who works for the Bindings Project, but as uh, Kieran from the Earthworm Society of Britain. So it's an Earthworm Society of Britain presentation. So I thought I'd start by telling you who I am. And this is really a little bit of a caveat so that you don't ask me questions that are too difficult. Um, I started my journey with earthworms when uh, um, about 10 years ago, when I was volunteering for the Natural History Museum as a research assistant in the Soil Biodiversity Group. So that involved going to sites in the New Forest and in Borneo, which is super exciting, and collecting soil invertebrates and helping to identify them there. I then ended up as the recording officer for the Earthworm Society of Britain, which leads to me being the national recorder for earthworms for the Biological Records Centre. I'm also, even before I worked for the Field Studies Council, I was an associate tutor teaching earthworms for them. Um, I chair the Ecology and Entomology Committee for London Natural History Society, because I'm also the London recorder for earthworms. And finally, I'm the Earthworm Society of Britain representative on, with bug life. So these are all the organisations that I'm involved with, with regards to earthworms. So you may see from that, a lot of it's about ID teaching and recording. So um, I haven't ever really done any ecological research on earthworms. So just to be aware of that. So um, before I start, I just want to tell you a little bit about the Earthworm Society of Britain. It's a national society that focuses on the recording of earthworms. So we've got a great website, which Matthew will drop in the, the chat for you to have a look for more information, information about how to get involved and details of the things that we've got, um, we've got running. Obviously, we haven't got any uh, place-based courses at the moment, but we will have um, another earthworm talk coming up next week, which will be on earthworm biology with um, Holland Park Ecology Centre. And I'll get the information on the website uh, either this evening or tomorrow for that. Right, so I thought what I'd do is start with what is an earthworm? So an earthworm is not actually a, um, a taxonomic name, a grouping in the same way that a mammal or a butterfly, uh, a butterfly is or something like that. So earthworm is the common name for the largest members of Oligochaeta in the phylum Annelida. And don't worry if that doesn't make much sense to you, I'm going to kind of explain what that means. So um, it means basically that earthworms are segmented, um, segmented worms, that's what annelids are. Their closest relatives uh, in, are really, um, one, or one of their close relatives are leeches. So you can see here on the left, you've got a picture of a leech that I found at an FSC site, Malam Tarn. And on the right is an earthworm that we found um, in Goring on Thames by, by the River Thames. And superficially, they look very similar. They're both uh, segmented, both have a head and a tail. Um, leeches will actually have the saddle that, that you've got there on the earthworm as well. Uh, they'll develop that when they're an adult. Big difference is their diet and their mouth parts, um, obviously. So earthworms are segmented worms. When we look at their, how they fit taxonomically, when we're talking about earthworms, we're talking about a group of families. So to give you some context, I've got here um, the compost um, earthworm uh, or tiger worm or brambling worm, Icenia fetida, and I've got here um, a tiger. Now we can see here that a tiger belongs to the, the cat family, Felidae, and the earthworm belongs to Lumbricidae. So earthworms are a group of different families, They're the, uh, rather than a single family, although in the UK, they mainly belong to this one family, Lumbricidae. An easy way of defining earthworms is actually just to go to the, to the dictionary definition of the word. So earth means either the planet we live on, the world, or the substance of the land, the soil. So we're talking there about the latter. And a worm can be any number of creeping or burrowing invertebrate animals with long, slender, soft bodies and no limbs, or weak or despicable person. Um, in this case, we're talking, we're talking obviously about the first. So, based on that whistle-stop tour of um, what an earthworm is, I'd like you to take a look at these six pictures, and I'd like you to think about how many earthworms you think are, are up here. And then in in, in about 10 seconds, 
Holly's going to launch a poll which will ask you to answer. So let's see, um, let's see who knows what an earthworm is just by looking at a picture of a general, general worm. So they're all worms, but only, uh, but how many are earthworms? So Holly, if you're ready to launch the poll, yeah. So answers not on a postcard on the screen, right? Okay. Okay, we've got some slight disagreements. Something to point out as well, this is anonymous, so it doesn't matter if you get it wrong, we don't know, we can't see who's answering. Yeah, I just I can just see overall percentages. Right, okay. Only 19 of you left to answer. Come on, let's get a full house. If everybody can answer, that will be the first time ever. All right, okay, I'm going to end the poll there. 121 out of 139 um, responded. So we've got three. Um, so, yeah, 79% of people have went for three. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing that. I'm just going to explain quickly for those that... Um, the poll should have disappeared. If it hasn't, Holly, can you make it go away? <laughs> um, this one here is obviously a leech. This is a compost earthworm. This is another type of earthworm. This is a polychaete worm uh, that, that you get living in marine environments. This is a, another earthworm. And this is, of course, a slow worm. Uh, so the non-invertebrate, the vertebrate of the group. OK, so seems like most people know with what, an, what an earthworm is now. So that's good. So when we think about earthworm ecology, I think it's good to start off by going back in time a little bit. And if we go back to between 322 and 384 BC, um, Aristotle was one of the first philosophers to really recognize the importance of earthworms. And he said something along the lines of earthworms are the intestines of the earth. So long, long ago, people realized that they are important. And then if we come forward quite a bit in time and we go to a correspondence from Gilbert White in 1777, he noted in uh, one of his correspondences that earthworms, though in appearance, a small and despicable link in the chain of nature, yet if lost would make a lamentable chasm. Um, so, Personally, I find his comments quite offensive about the desp despicable link in the chain of nature. I think they're quite beautiful organisms, but each to their own. At least he did recognise, uh, if they were lost, what a, what a gap they would leave. Um, and then if we come forward just a little bit more in time to Charles Darwin, J Charles Darwin actually wrote a book on earthworms where he said worms have played a, most, uh, a more important part in the history of the world than most persons would have first supposed. And I mean, this really summarises earthworms, I think, to a T. They're hugely important for many, many things uh, and not always given the credit that they deserve with that. Although I think we're quite lucky with it as an invertebrate group worms don't tend to be viewed as negatively by the general public. So most people like worms, uh, just not all of them would necessarily pick them up. <laughs> um, I'm not going to talk too much about Darwin because um, my fellow Earthworm Society um, tutor, Kerry, actually did a, another virtual meetup on earthworms and Darwin's experiments on earthworms last week. I couldn't attend but I managed to catch up with it yesterday and it's an absolutely fantastic talk much better than mine will be so I highly recommend that you if you didn't see it that you catch up with it on YouTube uh, it's also um, on the latest news article on the Earthworm Society of Britain website as well um, if you can't find it on YouTube but I'm sure Matthew will drop a link in the chat for you as well okay so right Time to, time to test your knowledge on something that I've not even spoke about yet, although Kerry might have mentioned this last week. So people can often be surprised to realise that there is more than one type of earthworm. So I wanted to know what you guys thought about the diversity that we have of uh, British earthworms within, the British, uh, yeah, with, within our island. So this includes Ireland. It's the UK and Ireland and the associated islands. So how many species of earthworm do we have in the British Isles? So Holly, if you could launch the poll. Um, I'm giving you a few options here. So I've said we don't have any. We have around three, around 30, 
around 300, around 3,000, or around 3 million. So give you a little bit more time. If you don't know, don't worry, have a guess. I can already see from what people have answered so far that the opinions divided about what this might be. Okay, right, we're coming up to 30 seconds, so I'm going to end the poll now. And I'm going to share the results. So 64% of you said 30, around 30. 30% said around 300. I made a few for 3,000 and around three. Well, actually, with earthworms, for an invertebrate group, there's a surprisingly small number of species. We actually only have um, 31 species in the UK and Ireland. If we're just looking at the UK, we only have 29. So around 30 was the correct answer. Um, however, that could well increase if, um, if the geneticists look in more detail at at um, the genetics of the species that we've got. It may be that some species are actually, some, some species that we think are a species are actually a complex of several species. Uh, there's certainly some arguments about that with specific species that we've got. So, earthwork, um, so we've got 31 species. I want to do a little bit of a, a caveat here and just explain, we've got, over 30 species in the UK and Ireland, to identify them, they're not something that can be done in the field. So this diagram here shows you the identification features that are used for earthworm ID in the UK. Now, most of these features you would need to look at under, under a microscope. So it's, it's worth noting that really you do have to go into a little bit of detail with earthworms to ID them. We're actually quite lucky in the UK because anywhere else in the world you have to dissect them, so at least we don't quite have to go that far. But it does mean in order to identify earthworms reliably, reliably to species, you do need to uh, generally um, capture them and preserve them and then look at the preserved specimen under a microscope. It's very difficult to see some of these features on a live earthworm. Um, especially as some of those features, it involves counting segments and that is very difficult with an animal that can move its body in all sorts of different um, dimensions. So yeah, just so you know that this will not be an earthworm ID um, talk. Uh, if you do want to learn how to identify earthworms, the Earthworm Society of Britain has worked with the Field Studies Council to develop a training program um, so that you can you can get the skills that you need to identify earthworms. Um, it does all focus around the, the publication that was shamelessly um, promoted at the beginning of the um, talk, because that is the you know, that is the recommended ID resource for earthworms in the UK. Like I said, though, just bear in mind that earthworm ID does require microscopes. Uh, the one course there that you wouldn't really need a microscope for is our Learn to Love Earthworms course, where we go into more detail about earthworm biology and ecology. So earthworm ecology. When we talk about earthworm ecology, we quite often talk about earthworms as belonging to one of a number of ecological groupings or ecotypes, as we sometimes call them. And for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to talk about four um, ecological groupings. And then when I've taught you how to differentiate between different earthworms for these groupings, I'm then going to tell you about some science which explains why it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that in reality. But for the purpose of engaging with, um, with children and for engaging with the wider um, public and um, the agricultural community and things like that, quite often it's, it's useful to talk about earthworms in these ecological groupings. So they're defined, um, they're defined by what they look like and what they do. Um, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about that later. So in this diagram, what you can see are several different earthworms occupying a different vertical space in the habitat. So if you think of this as a cross section going through the soil as well. So you've got deep burrowing earthworms, you've got shallow burrowing earthworms, you've got ones that live on the surface. There's a fourth group mentioned here, Epi and we're not going to go into that in detail in this talk today. I'll mention it a little bit later on. The fourth group that we actually deal with um, is a group called compost earthworms. So I'll get to that in a sec. So 
yeah, they operate, they all can be found at different uh, vertical places in the, in the soul profile. So we call these four groups, anesic, endogeic, epigeic, and compost. And these all relate to their vertical, the names actually link back to where they are vertically. So endo, for example, means within, so they're uh, earthworms within the soul, and epigeic means above. Um, no prizes for guessing what the term compost means. It's, yeah, there are compost earthworms. So I'm going to go through each of these in turn, explain a little bit about what they do, a little bit about how you can identify an earthworm in the wild, in the field, as belonging to one of these groups. Um, okay, and then I'm going to give you a little test to see how much people have been listening. Right, okay, so we're going to start right at the bottom of that, that vertical um, cross-section with the anesic earthworms. So the anesic earthworms are our deep burrowing earthworms. And what they do is they will burrow vertically in the soil and they'll live in this um, deep vertical burrow. And they will consume soil at the bottom, like deep, very nutrient poor soil, but they'll also come to the surface and they'll feed on um, leaf litter and decaying plant material. Um, I have actually seen evidence of them um, nibbling on blades of grass as well. So it looks like sometimes they do eat um, living, uh, living plant material as well. So they eat this nutrient poor soil. They eat these um, leaves and break the leaves down into their, into their nutrient components. And what happens is this all occurs in their digestive system. The, the food passes through their body, the microbes... Uh, microbes add to that and out the end you get the earthworm poo. Now the earthworm poo then is a mixture of that nutrient poor soil with the nutrient rich leaves and that, and that creates really nutrient rich um, casts which are then going to form part of the soil as well. So they, they do those casts on the surface and I'll show you a photo of that in a second. So they also, they quite often will surface at night when they're feeding so they can be a nocturnal nocturnally um, appearing animals and they'll also mate at night as well. Um, so I'll come to the bottom two points in a second but just to explain a little bit about their behaviour. Um, one species, Lumbricus terrestris, which is our, probably our most iconic earthworm, it's the biggest one we've got, we can grow up to 40 centimetres, it will do something which we call uh, building middens. And these middens it uses to block up the entrance to its hole. We think that's to stop cold air blowing, blowing in and, and desiccating the earthworm, so drying it out. Um, and here are some photos that I've collected from various other people, um, and they show some um, earthworm middens. So earthworms will use different materials like soil, leaves, stones um, to, um, to create these blocks. So, I think Kerry mentioned them in her talk, uh, just to highlight some. So there's one there. There's one from a bit of a side profile there. And here you can see two together. Quite often they tend to be the optimal um, distance apart for the earthworms to mate. Because when the earthworms come out at night, they, don't, they usually don't come fully out of their burrow. The anesic earthworms will quite often anchor them their cells in the burrow with their tail by flattening it, by winding it so they've got a really good grip. And the distance between these two middens here will be, oh, will be sufficient for the earthworms to reach each other and mate. Um, not all anesic earthworms create middens. It's really, mo most of the things that I've read suggest just Lumbricus terrestris, the lobworm or the common earthworm. Um, a rare close relative of that, Lumbricus friendi, which is a lot more common in France, but quite rare in the UK, um, that seems to also do the same. So unfortunately, an earthworm midden doesn't, we don't know for sure that that is a Lumbricus terrestris, although it is more slightly. Um, other anesthetic earthworms, though, they'll still leave evidence on the surface at the edge, at the top of their burrows. Here we've got an earthworm cast or an earthworm poo. Um, and this is that mixture of 
really nutrient poor soil with really nutrient poor uh, re nutrient rich li digested leaf that are all mixed up and it's laid as a cast on the um, surface of the ground now weather will wear like including rain and wind will wear that down and that will that will level out as um, really nutrient rich topsoil in fact more nutrient rich than, than your average topsoil so um, and Kerry talks a bit about the impact that this has on burying items in her Darwin talk so again highly recommended so if we go back to anesthetic earthworms we know now what they do but how do we tell that an earthworm that we found in the garden is an anesthetic earthworm well, there's a couple of things really. Um, firstly, we can tell by the size. So anesthetic earthworms are really the, the, they're the big earthworms of the earthworm world. Um, they can be up to 40 centimetres in the UK and quite often even a juvenile um, earthworm, which you can tell by the lack of saddle on an earthworm, it means it's, it's not fully um, grown up when it's uh, not got a saddle. Uh, even a juvenile will quite often be bigger than some of the other types of earthworms, some of the other adult types of earthworms. So, yeah, so when you've got a big chunky earthworm, it's quite often an anesthetic earthworm. They're also quite distinctive in colour. So they tend to be darker towards the head end, which is here, and they go, they have a gradient getting to lighter where you get to the tail, where this one's actually quite pale. The tail, like I said, can be a bit flattened. This one looks like it's been flattened a little bit here. You can see it's fatter there than it is there. Um, and this gradient with a very dark head is quite distinctive of anesthetic earthworms, as is a large size. The way that I like to remember it is the colour of a, an earthworm ecological group kind of seems to relate to how much it's above ground. So with the anesthetic earthworm its tail is rarely above ground its head is quite commonly above ground at night so it's darker at the end that it's it's um above ground obviously earthworms avoid the sun because it dries them out but i like to think of it in the same way as a suntan the part of the earthworm that, that sees the most of the outside world tends to be darker um just like your tongue gets darker the more sun that you get so that's that's how i remember it so if we move on to the next group, we've got the endogeics. So we're moving up through that soil profile now. So we're still in the soil. The endogeics, or the ones that live within the soil still as well, these are our shallow burrowing earthworms. Now, unlike the anesthetic earthworms, they don't really like coming to the surface. They tend to just eat soil. They mainly feed on, on soil. And they have no need to come to the surface. Coming to the surface risks, risks predation. And they, they will live in horizontal burrows in the upper soil layers usually. So the um, anesthetic earthworm will have its, its vertical burrows, which it will it'll have that burrow system that it lives in fairly permanently. The endogenic earthworms will tend to, they'll reuse some of their burrows, but they won't, they won't have as permanent a structure of burrows and they'll, they'll be constantly creating new ones as they um, move through the soil, feeding on the soil. Um, yeah. Oh. Thinking again back to the suntan analogy, with endogenic earthworms, how do we tell it's an endogenic earthworm? Well, they very, very rarely um, come to the surface. So if they're rarely coming to the surface, they're going to be the opposite of the anesthetics with the dark head. They tend to be quite pale. So when you're digging in your garden and you find an earthworm that looks a bit sickly, like it's ill because it's a weird green or a grey or even blue or the pale colour, brown, um, that usually is because it's an anesthetic earthworm. So it's not usually because it's ill. It's just the, the colouration that you get in um, endogenic earthworms. Now, although they, I say they're quite pale and sickly <laughs> coloured, you actually get quite a lot of variation in these colours. And sometimes they might have yellow or different coloured bands. Um, you can see here, it's darker there, lighter there, darker there. And, and the range of colours in the endogenics is, is quite impressive, I think. So, yeah, well worth having a closer look. And I could always do with more photos of live endogenic earthworms. So if you're taking a photo, send them over to me. Um, endogenics 
tend to be, again, they're not usually very small. They tend to be medium to large size. And the biggest of the endogeics actually can, it, it rivals the biggest of the anesics in terms of thickness. And, and they don't get, they're not that much smaller as well. Um, you will sometimes see them coming to the surface, so after rain. So some, quite often when you see earthworms uh, getting caught out on the pavement after rain, quite often that's an endogeic earthworm that's come to disperse while the, while, while the ground is wet and it's safer to travel and then get caught out. Uh, yeah, there's a couple of species I've noticed of endogeics that seem to do that quite a lot. So our third ecological grouping are the epigeics. And the epigeics are the above ground earthworms. So these are our surface dwelling earthworms. So these tend not to be found in the soil. And when they are found in the soil, usually it's just in the very top of the soil under um, an item like a, a log or a plant pot or something like that. Um, they tend to be found in leaf litter, dung and dead wood. So these, these guys are living in um, habitats that have quite high nutrient content because they feed on decaying plant and animal waste. Um, so you will find them in, like I said, in rotten logs. So here is an example of an epigeic earthworm that has been found through looking through some dead wood. Um, so quite often when you find these, they can be quite clean because they don't actually live within the soil. So yeah. Um, how do you tell it's an epigeic earthworm? Well, again, if you think back to that suntan analogy, it's above ground all the time. So again, they're quite dark in colour. Again, they quite often have a gradient of darkness from the head down to the tail, as you can see in this example here. But the big difference with anesic earthworms is they're much smaller. I mean, the, the smallest of these is just 1.5 centimetres long as an adult. So they're much, much smaller. They're commonly even around two or three centimetres. Uh, so remember, if you're looking at earthworms in the wild, you're looking under a log, don't assume it's a juvenile just because it's small. Have a look for the presence of a saddle here. If it's small with a saddle, it's an epigeic earthworm. Yeah. So that's our epigeics. And they're the, three, they're the three main ecological groupings that we, that we talk about in earthworm ecology. In the UK, for, we talk about a fourth one, which doesn't really fit as neatly into those, and that's the compost earthworms. Now, these are kind of a subset of the epigeic earthworms, and uh, some scientists, when they're talking about earthworms, will always classify uh, these as epigeics, because they, they do live above ground. But you do tend to get them in a very specific environment. So it's always very high organic matter, um, like compost bins, but also in really rotten dead wood and um, in compost. So you quite often will find them alongside the epigeic earthworms. Um, how are they different from an epigeic earthworm? Well, for a start, they're actually much bigger usually. Uh, these are usually a medium to large size. So anybody who's got a compost bin, they're most likely to have uh, one of two species, the tiger or branding worm, Icenia fetida, or um, another species that looks very similar, the um, Dendrobina venita. Now, they both, these compost earthworms have this very distinctive stripy look. So again, colour wise, they have that dark to slightly lighter um, gradient along the length of the body, but they have this almost stripy appearance, which is why one of them has a common name, the tiger worm. Um, uh, they're also quite distinctive when, when you pick them up, because compost, uh, compost earthworms feed on this really high organic matter and they breed really fast, everything about them, they, they, live, they live a very fast lifestyle. And when you pick them up in your hand, often they'll jump around, they'll, they'll move, flick their body quite quick, which, which can actually make them jump a little bit. So they're really, really active earthworms. Um, and that can be a bit of a telltale sign when you when you pick them up at your compost bin. Right, so that is our four types of earthworm. Now, I thought to make sure that I haven't lost people and nobody's fallen asleep after lunch, um, I thought I'd do a little bit of test. So I've conveniently here got an earthworm in the shape of a question mark. 
And this is gonna be the first of five um, tests for you. So I'd like you to tell me which ecological group this belongs to, or if it's not an earthworm at all. So Holly, if we can launch the poll. So this is our first one. Um, I can tell you, because it's hard to tell from the diagram, it, it's roughly a medium size. Um, we can see it's an adult because it's got a saddle, although it, it doesn't look like the, the usual saddle that we're used to. So yeah, if everybody, everybody has a go, look at the gradient of the coloring, color on it. Look at the, um, yeah, is it dark? Is it, is it light? Um, and like I said, it's, it's around a medium size, so it's not too small, not too big. Okay, I'm gonna end that. We've got 77% of people have answered. And 87% of you went for endogenic. Uh, that's not bad. I'll take that. That means that people have been listening and, and that I've got my point across with endogenics because it is actually an endogenic earthworm. So this earthworm is Aparectidia rosea. And it, uh, it's a typical endogenic earthworm. It's, it's relatively pigmentless. It's quite pink. Um, you can see through it quite clearly as well. This is, that's quite often the case with... Um, uh, Ender Jakes, we can see it's the, the dark outlines of its gut there. Oh, I didn't share. Yeah, there we go. 87% uh, said Ender Jake. Okay, right, well done. Let's go on to the next one then. Here's your next earthworm. So, Holly, if you launch the poll, let's see how people do here. So, again, you've got the same options. Have a vote. I should tell you that it's, it's, um, it's quite small. So if we look at it, it's on moss there. We can see the individual bits of the moss there. So this isn't a big earthworm. Um, it's relatively small. Um, anesic means deep burrowing. Epigeic means that it lives above ground. Surface dweller. Endogeic means it's shallow burrowing. Compost means um, it, it's one of our compost species. Um, I will tell you already that it is an earthworm. So. I'm pleased to see that zero percent of people have thought this was something else. I'm going to end the poll there and share the results. So yeah, 86 percent of you say epigeic. It is epigeic. This is Sachelius mammalis, or the little tree worm. Uh, it's a worm that you co commonly found at the find at the base of uh, hedgerows and things like that. So yeah, nice, nicely done. 86 percent, and uh, you guys got that. You guys got that right, brilliant. Right, okay, uh, we'll close that down and we'll go on to the next one. So you can't really tell here, but this is quite a big earthworm. Holly, if you can launch the poll. So this is quite a large earthworm. What I'd tell you to have a look at here as well is have a look at the gradient of the color. Have a look maybe at the tail. Is there anything you can see about the tail there that might give it away? Um, yeah, it's so, yeah, I'd say this one was over 20 centimetres when we found it. So, yeah, it's definitely towards the larger end of the, um, larger end of it. Okay, give you a couple more seconds to vote. And there we go, right, share, I'm sharing the results now, so you should all be able to see that. 91% of you said anesic, 91% um, you were correct. This is, this is, um, Lumbricus terrestris. And I'll just point out here, you've got at the top there, you've got the tail, the head's towards the bottom. The tail looks like it's flattened, which is really typical of anesic earthworms. Um, right, okay. Fifth and no, fourth one here, sorry. So again, this one is actually quite, it's quite a medium to long to large size. Holly, if you can launch the pole. So medium to large size, I'd say, look, is there a gradient of the color there? Is it, is it dark? Is it pale? Um, medium to large size, is it stripey? Yeah, I'm gonna go a bit quicker to make sure we finish the talk in time there. So three, two, one, and right, end the poll. I'm gonna share the results. 78% of you said endogenic. Again, you guys are doing absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm going to give myself all the credit for that and say I must be a good teacher. <laughs> right. Um, yes, this is Octal one of the Octalasian species. I think it was Octalasian lactium, um, which is uh, yeah, very typical 
energetic, very pale um, earthworm species. Right, fifth and final one, Holly, if you'll launch the poll. This is a medium sized earthworm, medium to large really. Um, and we found this at Slapton Lee, uh, which is an FSC centre down in Devon. It's a lovely centre. We manage the nature reserve there as well, which is a, uh, a lagoon that's um, just off from the beach. It's a beautiful place to visit. And you might not be surprised to find out, as I end the poll and share the results, that this was found in a compost bin. Um, and for anybody that's thinking, looking at that, it's a tiger worm or a banding worm, you'd be wrong. It actually looks like it is, but it wasn't. It was Dendrobina venita and other species. So this is why we don't accept records uh, just from a photo of uh, compost worms, because they can be quite confusing. Right, okay. So that's basically my talk on earthworm ecology. What I wanted to just very quickly go over now was let you know that actually, in reality, so that, that's a good way of looking at it for a beginner, but in reality, it's a bit more complicated than, than that. So unfortunately, it's not quite as simple as that. So sometimes these categories don't fully work. And the reason for that, there's a number of reasons. First of all, this slide doesn't look like it did when I did it earlier. We've got a couple of very specialist earthworms that don't quite fit. So we've got arboreal earthworms that you actually find up trees, living in rock holes and tree forks. Um, so that's kind of another, um, another ecological grouping, but the earthworms that you find up trees, you also find in other epigeic um, habitats. And we've got quite a few wet soil specialists, so you only find them in habitats where the soils are very saturated. And we've got a number that are like that. And they don't feed on humic accumulations in tree holes. I obviously didn't save my presentation because this was the last edit I made. Um, they feed on soil. Uh, so there, there's an edit not being saved there. And in the UK, there's only one species we really, really think that's truly arboreal. Uh, we've got a number of wet soil specialists. So there's that to consider. There's also how these um, earthworms were categorized into these groups. So traditionally, it was actually done on what we call morpho-anatomical features. So a, a number of features were used to categorise which group the different British species would fall into. Um, and a recent study has kind of explained that a bit, which was really useful. Um, so these are some of the features and how the different groups uh, relate to that. However, they should also really be categorised on where they are vertically in the soil profile, which can be very difficult to establish, and also uh, their ecological preferences as well. So the, one of the dangers is basically that with a lot of the literature, they're being categorised based on their anatomical traits, so their morphology, their, their features, but really we should be doing more to look at the ecology, and that's something that I'd like to, to match up more with with how they're categorized. Um, and that recent study that I said that looked at it, actually when they plotted out different earthworm species, th what they did was they measured, rather than looking at whether something was anisic, epigeic or endogeic, they treated these as three different qualities that an earthworm would have. And using those morphological, those anatomical traits, they looked at what percentage each species belong to each of those three main groups, anisic, endogeic, and epigeic. And what they found when they mapped this out is actually there isn't, there's really seven groups. So there's each of the three main groups, there's a halfway point between each group, and then there's an intermediate, intermediate category where you've got something that is equally anisic, endogeic, and epigeic. Uh, so it it might perform all of those functions. And that's certainly something um, when we've been doing our earthworm recording that we've found that things don't seem to do always what they're supposed to do based on their color, their size and et cetera. So that's a really interesting study. And I think this will change the way in the future that we categorize these. Um, I think it just needs to be backed up with a bit more information about ecology. 
Uh, and that brings me to the Earth Home Society of Britain. What we've been doing, if we look at the data that was held on Earth Home distributions in 2009 compared to 2017, we've got a lot more data than we originally had for these ecological groupings. So all that work was done in France in, originally in 1970. That paper on the last slide came out uh, this month, or, or this, yeah, this month. And I'm now saying we've got a lot more data. Maybe it's time for us to actually look at that data and see if we can recategorize how these earthworms uh, belong to these different ecological groups. So as an example here on the left hand side, you've got um, Natural England's report on earthworm, uh, earthworm distribution in the UK and they mapped out which were the most common species. Um, if I take the earthworm site data and add it to the Natural England data, combine them, we get very different results. So what that tells us is that the earthworm site data, because it's looking at a, a lot broader range of habitats, and it's a broader geographical range than the Natural England data, we're learning a lot more about our earthworms, which means maybe it's time to look again at how we categorise those ecological groupings and rethink whether maybe it's not quite as simple as that and we've currently got a project going on within the earthworm society where we're looking at our data and we're trying to enhance that record data uh, by going back into it and seeing if we can better assign habitats and microhabitats so that we can go into a lot more depth about habitat preferences and these ecological groupings of earthworms so as you can see here we're now up to 16,628 records of of earthworms in the UK and Ireland and that's our exciting next step and I hope in a year's time to be able to give a talk on the findings of that study because um, hopefully by then we should have a paper out actually telling everybody what we found and that is the end of my talk so I'm going to stop sharing I'm going to attempt to turn my video back on Hopefully I won't go into um, evil robot mode. And I welcome any questions, if there are any. Yeah, there's loads of questions already. Thanks for that, Kieran. I will read through them all now. So we had one from Janneke earlier on in the talk. Um, he mentioned that elsewhere you would have to dissect an earthworm to be able to identify it, but you don't have to do that here. Why is this? Um, it's because actually we've got, oh, hang on. Yeah, it's going jumpy. There we go. Yeah, can you hear me better now? Yeah. Yeah, so the reason for that is actually the UK has a very low diversity of earthworms. And I have no evidence to back up what I'm about to say, but I believe that might be to do with how effective our earthworms are at the jobs that they do. So I think we've got really, really... Um, efficient earthworms because our earthworms are tend to be invasive species across the rest of the world so in the, the rest of the world quite often has British species present because as invasive species because they've been introduced either on purpose or by accident through um, to promote crop growth to um, through plants and various other means um, as discarded fishing bait and through composting as well so we have a relatively small diversity of earthworms and it just so happens that the, the species we've got can be separated by features. Yeah, am I breaking up? Slightly, yeah. Could you repli uh, repeat that last sentence, please? You went into robot mode. <laughs> yeah, so I was just stating that um, in the UK, it just so happens that with our small number of species, we can we can divide them up using five externally visible anatomical features. The rest of the world, have, because they have more earthworms, so in France, I think you're looking at maybe double what we've got or around that. The, the earthworms don't have that many external features. So you just can't divide them up without looking internally at some of their organs to separate them out did you get that 
more or less I think there were a few words that sort of stretched out um, but I think I think we've got that um, Eleanor was asking how deep are the burrows of anisic earthworms oh that's a good question off the top of my head I can't remember but definitely down to two meters it's no problem down to two meters what earthworms will sometimes do as well is if the weather Deal. If the ground is freezing or is very dry, the anisic earthworms will go down the east of Asia in summer. Uh, so they, they may go down even deeper. Did you get that? I think more or less they go deeper in the summer. I think it's sort of. No, they'll go deeper in the summer or winter if the, if the conditions are not good for them. Bro. Thank you. Uh, Lawrence was asking, can earthworms digest cellulose or are they dependent on microbial cultures for that? That is beyond my knowledge. So I'm going to refer that to an earthworm biologist. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know that much detail about the, the biochemistry that goes on within an earthworm. No worries. Um, Danny, you've got your hand up. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask Kieran your question? I can't see you on here at the moment. Okay, I'm going to keep going through the chat for now. Feel free to interrupt Danny if you want to ask your question. Um, Edward was asking, is there only one earthworm per burrow or do they cohabit at all? Um, earthworm burrows will intercept, as far as I'm aware, each, each individual will have its own system. They don't, they don't live together as a community. Um, but in a compost bin, for example, you will find bundles of them. So, yeah, again, I don't know if there's been any studies on this, but they may incidentally use each other's burrows but they don't create a burrow system together like other animals like a badger like badgers for example or anything like that yeah thank you um amy was asking how do arboreal earthworms climb trees uh, so earthworms have these tiny little um hairs or they're called cetia um, they have um a ring of um eight on each ring on each segment and they use those to grip. So earthworms are actually very, very good climbers. And anybody who's got a compost bin will know that quite often you get an accumulation of them in the top of the lid, uh, even though the lid's made of plastic. Uh, so they're able to climb, no problem. Uh, if you start a compost bin and you don't put earthworms, they still somehow manage to get in there. So yeah, they're great climbers. Uh, so they have no problem getting up there. How they detect the, the, the microhabitat is suitable for them there I've no idea <laughs> okay thank you uh, Lisa is asking do you know roughly how many of the species belong to those ecotypes in the UK um, yeah we've got a breakdown of it I don't know off the top of my head how many belong to each but um, there's not a large number of anesics we only have five I think um, and then there's quite a number of endogeics there's quite a few anesics uh, epigeics and only a small number of compost so there seems to be a lot more variation in the epigeics and the endogeics um, but what I haven't had a chance to do because that paper only came to me uh, yesterday is have a look at how miscategorized the British species are because it, it'll be interesting to see how many of our endogeics are miscategorized. I'm really looking forward to, to going into detail. You're breaking up again, Kieran, sorry. With that, with that data to, to see how it varies from what the FSC publicity 
yeah, my, my internet's still bad. <laughs> it is, yeah. We've got, we'll go through a few more questions. Um, Annie was asking, do we know if earthworms are in decline? And if so, what are the drivers? Are you there, Kieran? We don't have enough. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, sorry. There was a bit of a pause. I thought you might have gone completely then. Okay, so we don't know for certain if earthworms are in decline because we don't have enough data um, about about earthworm populations. However, there has been some evidence to suggest that earthworms are actually increasing. Um, so there, there, are, there are not really any, there are no species that have conservation status protection in the UK, but some of our rarest species are very difficult to find and we, and we simply have so little data that we can't comment on them. Uh, but like I said, our earthworms in, in the UK tend to do well. So if anything, our species tend to spread across the rest of the world and might even be a threat to native earthworms in other countries. Oh, thank you. Um, Eleanor was asking to see the slide again with all the different ecotypes. We are recording this. Um, you'll be able to watch that back again on the recording. But she was also asking, could you say something more about the saddle on the earthworm? What is it? So the saddle is otherwise known as a clitella. And it, it's basically, it contains, it plays a big part in reproduction. So it's, it's where the, the um, what happens in reproduction is it forms what we call a mucus sheath, which slides down the earthworm over the head um, on the way it picks up eggs from the earthworm and sperm that the earthworm stored from a mate and that then comes off the head of the earthworm where it kind of pinches at both sides and it forms what we call an earthworm cocoon which is an earthworm egg casing um, and the saddle there's a feature on the saddle called the tubercular pubertatus which is used for the two earthworm when two earthworms mate it's used to grip each other and you know, you know how quite often when you're identifying various invertebrate groups, it quite often gets down to the, the penis with how you uh, differentiate between species. So organs are always quite important in identification. And it's the same in earthworms. The position of the saddle on the earthworm, the segment numbers it, it takes up, and the shape and size of the that, that feature I said, the tubercular pubertatus, a key ID features as well. Great, thank you. David was asking, in an agricultural context, what can we do to increase earthworm numbers? Um, so with earthworms, it's going to be a lot of the same practices that are good for other wildlife. It's, it's about limiting the disturbance to an agricultural um, habitat. So, so employing no-till, for example, um, reduces uh, the, the detrimental effect to earthworms, uh, providing cover crops and things like that. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of agricultural practices that are generally known to be better for wildlife and the soil in particular that are good for earthworms. So, um, Obviously, the more you're disturbing an environment, the more detrimental it's going to be for most of the wildlife living there and churning up the soils uh, uh, several times a year or annually is going to have an impact, particularly on the anaesthetic earthworm populations. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm just reading through the questions. <laughs> one you probably can't explain right now but how do earthworms mate louisa was asking and do they lay eggs there and can they reproduce without mating so uh earthworms are hermaphrodites which means that which means that they have um, google why, why are you doing this both male and female um male and female reproductive organs um when they mate 
they, they act as what we call simultaneous hermaphrodites. Bear with me, my internet signal is going bad. Um, has it caught up? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you okay at the moment. Okay, so they act as simultaneous hermaphrodites, which means that both um, earthworms while mating will act as a male and a female and they'll exchange um, sperm both ways. So when, when they mate, they essentially like 69 in exchange sperm. Um, and there's information on the Earthworm Society of Britain website under, the, under our life cycle um, page that gives more information on that. They don't lay eggs as such. They, the egg is contained in an egg casing called a cocoon, uh, which I explained a little bit about earlier. And again, on our website, there's a bit more information, but you will find these um, earthworm cocoons lying in the soil of the compost. Great. Oh, and can they reproduce asexually? Yes. And some species have a particular preference for that as well. So one of the species that you correctly guessed right is endogeic, uh, Octalasian lactium. That tends to re reproduce through a process called parthenogenesis, which is a type of asexual, so not sexual reproduction. Great, thank you. And we'll send around the link to that afterwards as well, so you can see that information on the website. Uh, Stephen was asking, are all earthworms detritivores or herbivores, or will any of them eat other invertebrates? Uh, as far as I'm aware, no earthworms are intentional predators. However, when we're talking about invertebrates in the soil, because uh, earthworms are quite often forgotten, I'm very aware that we might forget other organisms. So do earthworms eat lots of tiny little nematodes when they're eating the soil? Yes, of course they do. Um, it's unavoidable. So they'll be eating uh, soil bacteria, they'll be eat, eating uh, nematodes and other organisms that are in the soil that are much, much smaller than them. Um, whether that's incidental or whether that's a core part of their diet, I'm afraid I can't answer, but they're all classed as detritivores in general. Um, and there's been debate about whether they actually eat um, live living plant material, but I've seen a video on YouTube of um, a anisica from niggle, niggle, uh, nibbling on blades of grass. And that explains to me why when I sample a playing field, for example, that is mown constantly, um, why that seems to be the habitat that has the biggest abundance of earthworms in. So playing fields, amenity grasslands are great for sampling earthworms. They have loads of earthworms in them. And if earthworms, anesthetic earthworms only at leaf litter, that, that wouldn't stack up because you get, that's where you do find anesthetic earthworms a bit more commonly. Thank you. Now we've had another question from Lawrence asking, do you know if their ecological groupings correspond to the taxonomic groupings? So are earthworms in the same ecotype more closely related to one another? Uh, the quick answer to this is no. There, it's actually very, very varied. There, you might find that one genus, for example, has, um, has a leniency towards one um, ecological grouping, but it's certainly, it's certainly not that clear cut. And that could be because of a number of reasons. It could be um, convergent evolution, where different um, genera, so different genus of uh, earthworms have evolved similar behaviors. It could be because the taxonomy is not correct. Uh, earthworms have always been moved, moved around um, in terms of species names and, and the genus names. However, I think the, the true thing is, I think, I think evolutionarily, I'm actually, I believe that earthworms have all three ecological groups in their history. And I think that the way that we define the ecological grouping shouldn't be a category, but a percentage towards each of the three main groups. So for example, you might say that something is 80% anesic, 10% epigeic, 10% endogeic. And that's what that paper that came out this month is um, explaining. And when we go back to the, the scientific study that brought in 
these categories. That's actually what the the French gone completely, I'm afraid, Kieran. Um, was kind of saying, and we the scientific community has kind of ignored some of his use um his categorization techniques. So we think if any Okay, I think we will end it there, Kieran. We're almost up, up um, out of time anyway, and you've turned into yeah full on robot mode now. <laughs> so uh, yeah, thank you for sharing your earthworm knowledge with us today. I know there's lots of questions in the chat, so sorry we didn't manage to get through them all. Uh, we will send Ryan the links to the Earthworm Society website, and there's lots of information on there that will help answer some of those questions. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you all for attending today. Apologies, Kieran turned into a robot on a few occasions, but um, that's technology for you. Eh? So thank you, and hopefully we'll see you all again. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye.